moderator for this evening. Kelsey Johnson is an organizational strategist, interdisciplinary curator, artist, and writer. Uh, Kelsey currently serves as the executive director of space in Portland and is a member of our executive committee here at Sierra Club. And I just was here um, as part of the main chapter. We've had some really exciting additions this year, like Marina, who put together this beautiful series, and Anya for organizing the speakers. Um, so we're in a really great, um, great position. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Welcome. Um, I was briefly gardening today um, and trying to celebrate Earth Day uh, by actually having my hands on the earth, which felt pretty good. Um, I hope you've all celebrated or thought about a project or picked up some trash or done something that in a small way is kind of uh, tending to and loving the earth in your community. Um, oop. A couple things um, while I make a little error on my own end, uh, please keep your microphone on mute. Um, and turn off your turn on your video if you feel comfortable. Um, you can use the chat to ask questions ahead of time. I'll be looking through them. Um, there'll be a, each speaker is going to give a small presentation, and then um, we are going to discuss at the end. I'll ask a few questions, but if you have a burning question you don't want to forget about that somebody brings up a point of, please stick it in the chat, and um, we'll prioritize those questions that arise and uh, can hopefully answer a bunch more at the end of the panel. Uh, we want to make a land acknowledgement as we begin this process, and I've been thinking a lot, especially as we move towards new frontiers about intersectional environmentalism as a white woman, um, how we do these, and um, we want to recognize the people of the Don land, the Wabanaki Confederacy, who lived on this land and stewarded it in past tense, present tense, and future tense. And in that spirit, I've got a few um, resources that are helping me. Um, I recently picked up the book or was given the book uh, by Nick Estes, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance. And um, just as we bring up this topic of intersectionality and environmentalism, um, we have to acknowledge the water protectors and land protectors who have worked all over our country um, to do this for generations. And we're keeping this place far before many of us, um, many of our families arrived here in this on this land um, this afternoon. Oop, somebody needs to be muted. On this afternoon, I was uh, planting things and I suggest there's a new group that formed. There's about 400 people um, in this Facebook group and they have another website and portal called the Wabanaki Community Herbal Apothecary Mutual Aid. And the idea is that you uh, allocate part of your garden for growing herbs or specific um, traditional medicines that are asked for through this program with um, a series of Wabanaki leaders. Um, so, Think about what you can do with the resources you have to give land back or land of fruits of the land back. Um, we hope that you've been tuning into, oops, um, how do I go back? We hope that you've been tuning into other conversations, community conversations that um, the executive committee and Marina have been putting together, um, including reading about closing the Juniper Hill dumping loophole. And I suggest everybody check out our spring e-news as well as um, reading and writing your representative or council people about Wabanaki and uh, in indigenous sovereignty issues um, and figuring out how you can learn about who are the activists and how you can support them on that front that are in our community. Um, so that's a piece from 2017, but um, exploring what who Indigenous activists are and what their platform is here um, in the greater Portland area. And the last thing I want to say is that we also want to make a technology um, acknowledgement. And for those of you that haven't heard one before, it's new to me too. But thinking about the fact that during this pandemic, it's been such a bomb to have uh, technology that brings us together for these virtual events, but that there are rare earth minerals that are in these computers that are mainly getting mined and extracted in conflict zones um, that cause human rights violations worldwide and also can be bad for the environment in their extraction practices. Um, so we are grateful for the conversation it facilitates, but we're very much looking forward to all eventually getting back together in person um, where there isn't such a footprint for um, us gathering and talking. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am really excited to um, welcome my colleague and friend and uh, co-Sierra Club member on your right, um, who is a youth organizer here in Maine, um, based mid-coast, and uh, has joined the Sierra Club on staff last year. 
um, has been doing an incredible job both um, connecting youth climate action with the um, main chapters, vision, goals, and awareness, and how we can build more intergenerational coalitions, as well as a lot of the specific regional issues that are impacting um, her backyard. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Anya, who I believe has a video to share. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, yeah, I won't share my, the video that I'm going to share until like halfway through, um, but you can look forward to it. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Anya. I use she, her pronouns. I um, am based in Bar Harbor and I am the Grassroots Summit Action Organizer for the chapter. Really excited to be here you tonight to talk to you. I can get on. Oh, I think someone needs to mute. Oh, sorry. All right, we're all good. Um, so uh, yeah, really excited to be here with you all tonight to talk about um, climate justice. Um, and so what do we mean when we say climate justice? Um, I'm gonna share my screen quickly, share a slide. Um, so I wanna start with this definition um, by a group called Maine Climate Action Now, which is a coalition that Sierra Club Maine is a part of. Um, and the definition that uh, Maine Climate Action Now has come up with is that climate justice requires the recognition that the climate crisis was caused by failures of our political, social, and economic systems, and that it demands intersectional solutions that will transform these systems and hold those responsible for the climate crisis accountable, um, resulting in a livable future where we all can thrive. Um, and this is like a definition with a lot to imp unpack and many different organizations have different definitions of what climate justice is. Um, so feel free to do some research on your own to you know come up with a definition that fits fits um, your mentality the, the most. And I know Davis and, and Josh, um, my co-presenters tonight are going to talk a little bit about um, you know uh, our economic systems and um, social systems respectively. Uh, and how they relate to climate justice. So I'm not gonna touch a ton on those tonight, um, but stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I just wanna unpack um, climate justice generally and, and um, yeah, kind of start going over what it means to me. Um, so when we look at the climate crisis over time, um, the United States is the country that's most responsible for the climate crisis based on greenhouse gas emissions. And currently we're also the, the um, second highest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. The only country that's ahead of us is China. Um, and keep in mind too, that they have four times the population of us. Um, and so, and we're also one of the most powerful countries in the world. So when we think about the, the climate crisis, we know that most of humanity bears very little responsibility for the climate crisis itself. Um, it's estimated that the 85 lowest emitting countries in the world who have contributed virtually nothing to the problem of the climate crisis um, will bear 40% of the economic losses and 80% of the resulting deaths of climate change. Um, and the lion's share of the responsibility of, of climate change, where climate change comes from, um, comes from, so depending on, on how you determine that attribution, it, that responsibility falls upon a handful of corporations. Um, 100 companies are said to be responsible for 70% of all CO2 emissions over time. Um, the responsibility falls on a handful of industrialized countries with high levels of historic and, um, and per capita pollution. So think the, the United States, Canada, Europe, um, which is a continent, not a country, um, Australia and Japan. And so like those, those countries and, um, and continents together have emitted 66% of all emissions over time with less than 25% of the global population as a whole. Um, another way to think about who's responsible for the climate crisis is 10% um, of, um, or the wealthiest, the wealthiest 10% of the, 
of our world is currently responsible for 50% of our carbon emissions, whereas the poorest 50% of our global population accounts for less than 10% of our carbon emissions. And both the causes of and the impacts from climate change can be seen along um, very highly racialized, gendered, and class-determined lines, as, um, I, you know, as, as you can see from some of those statistics. Um, so I know I'm like starting off with a lot of math, but please bear with me. Um, so 2020, 2016, and 2019, in that order, have been the hottest years on record since you know the 1800s and when we started um, started recording that data. And so the planet has warmed um, about 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, so we're we're already experiencing global warming, um, and it continues to warm at a rate of about uh, 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. And um, something that I like to keep in mind is that the last time there was this much carbon in the atmosphere was over three million years ago, and the last time that global global average temperatures were two degrees Celsius warmer, the world's oceans were 82 feet higher, which I think is just an interesting fact. Um, and so these numbers are super abstract, but they're important. Um, and they, they also mask um, a very violent and very current reality for folks all over the world. Um, we're seeing massive crop failures in India, driving thousands of farmers to suicide. Um, we're seeing um, hundreds of millions of folks all over the world um, in hunger. Uh, we're seeing extreme weather and um, slow onset events, leaving hundreds of millions of people dis displaced. Um, and by slow onset, I mean events like uh, saltwater intrusion that's making drinking water undrinkable, um, uh, events like sea level rise, th things like that. Um, climate breakdown is causing the permanent loss of species. We're facing the fifth, um, fifth extinction. We're facing irreparable damage to ecosystems. Um, and the worsening of, of really every existing form of injustice that we see in, in the world. So hate to break to you, but um, we're all but guaranteed to warm another 0.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and we have a disturbingly high probability of a lot more warming than that. Um, we're really hurtling into a world that won't be able to sustain life as we know it. Um, we're looking at a world where Within this century, much of South Asia, where about 20% of our, our human population currently lives, um, that, that area will be too hot for humans to survive in the summertime. Um, this is a region that you know, is routinely devastated by, by drought. So some people speak about kind of the new normal of climate change, but really there's, there's nothing normal about this. Um, the global system is not going to stabilize once we, you know, reach 1.5 degrees of Celsius of warming, like the IPCC report talks about. Um, this is very new, very deadly, and very weird. Um, so before working at Sierra Club, um, I spent some time at international climate negotiations with a delegation of students from College of the Atlantic, where I graduated this June in Bar Harbor. And so I wanna dive a little bit more into how I saw some system failures playing out there. Um, so uh, these conferences are run by the United Nations. Um, and when we think about the United Nations, it's a very you know, highly regarded institution. Um, it's supposed to be an institution where Countries are coming together to work on global challenges and you know, solving world hunger and creating peace. Um, but really it's a space that's dominated by rich and developed countries. Um, it's dominated by international financial institutions, multinational corporations. Um, the UN climate conferences have lots of representation from oil and gas industries, um, lots of national elites. Um, and they're, they're really a, uh, a place where imperialist and capitalist interests are served and where that is the status quo. Um, it's it's kind of helpful to think that 
the UN is, is dealing with the histories of and, and relationships between nations. So the climate change negotiations are spaces of encounter between these post-colonial past or not post past colonial powers um, seeking to you know assert or reassert their dominance um, and formally colonized nations or underdeveloped nations seeking to to rebuff them um, and you know where we're having conversations about the responsibility of of nations. So all of this to say there are really deep deep inequalities between those who are most responsible for the climate crisis and those who are victim to it. Um, and I, I wanna share an experience that I had um, with you all now, uh, and I'll, sh I'll share a video in a moment, um, but I was in, in Madrid for the past climate conference um, in 2000 and 2018, pre-COVID, um, and an action that I took up took part in there was a, um, a, uh, a, a political action that was spearheaded by indigenous and global south and by global south, meaning, um, you know, the, the less developed portions of the world um, by civil society and trade unions and, and youth. And this was an action that um, brought all of these folks from the real world together to, um, to uh, rally against these, um, this uh, plenary, um, sorry, I'm getting lost, <laughs> this, this big plenary hearing. Um, and so it was to really draw attention to and demand um, rich countries tackle the climate crisis. And so during this demonstration, we were shut down very quickly by UN security and folks were kettlebelled, meaning that um, we were surrounded by UN security and physically pushed out of the conference center. Um, we were stripped of our badges, so we couldn't go back into the conference. Um, and then we were herded by, by military um, and police and, um, and left out in the cold. For me, it wasn't that cold. It was like 45 degrees um, in December in Madrid, but the relative cold for, for hours on end um, and, and to me, this just really shows how little these institutions are willing to listen to folks who are being, um, being affected by the climate crisis right now. So I'm, I'm going to share a quick video of some of the folks that are, um, that were speaking during the event. Um, and I can share the YouTube video in the chat after if you'd like to watch the whole clip. Um, and Angela, the first person who's speaking, she's, you'll notice that she's banging um, a spoon, uh, banging a, a, a cup with a spoon. And this is um, a form of protest called uh, Calza Rosaro, which is originated in Chile and involves like making noise by banging on pots and pans. So just a heads up there. Um, all right, and I'll share my screen. Her name is Angela. We are here in solidarity with Chile. With Chile and all countries that are facing human rights violations. We are here in solidarity with the frontline communities. With the millions of people in the global south who are facing the worst of the climate crisis. We are here because we haven't forgotten about them, about our present and our future. We are here because we, we need our governments to listen to us. This last week, it's been all about profit, carbon markets, nature-based solutions that don't respond to the needs of people and nature. If we unite, we can have a present and a future grounded in justice. No false solutions! No false solutions! No false solutions! We have one last speaker. She's from the Amazon, and she's here to share one last thing with all of you here. 
Mi nombre es Sandra Tucup. My name is Sandra Tucup. I am from the Ecuadorian Amazon. And I am here because our territories are being violated. Those industries that are causing climate change are polluting our rivers and our territories. We are here because we're defending our territory. We're defending biodiversity. We're defending the planet. We're defending the rivers. Because you know that in each and every one of us, we have water. We are water. Because without the water, we cannot live. Without Without our territory, without our soil, we cannot live. Without the earth, with, we cannot live, no matter how much money we have. The earth is our mother, and we are here to tell the big industries to stop violating our territories, to stop destroying our lands. All right, um, and I will share uh, the link to that in the chat if you would like to watch the full clip. Um, I will let me people know that there's um, images in that clip of very highly militarized police. If that is something that you do not want to watch, I do not recommend watching the rest of the clip. Um, so yeah, um, this clip brings up a lot of emotions for me, um, but um, so back to you know what fair shares look like and who's responsible to the climate crisis. Um, if the United States were to actually achieve its fair share of emissions reductions, we would have to reduce our emissions by about 195% by 2030. Um, so that means getting to at least 70% emissions reductions nationally um, and the remainder through support to develop to developing countries who we've put at risk. So that's how we get above that 100%. Um, so compared to the, to the Biden plan that came out today, um, Biden's plan is to reduce our emissions by uh, about 50% by 2030. So that's, that's really not enough when we look at, at fair shares. Um, and yeah. Um, that was a bit all over the map, but let's let's think about the state of Maine for a moment too. Um, and the thing about systems is that they're ever present at all levels of society, not just internationally. Um, so we see them, you know, at the international level, national level, state level, um, community level as well. Um, and so we're seeing in Maine that we too are not doing our fair share of climate action to, compared to what is needed. Um, when we, when we look at the, the state of Maine's climate goals to reduce um, our emissions by, oh, I forgot the number, uh, by 80% by 2050, um, that, that's not enough. Um, we're also seeing that private interests and those interested in maintaining the status quo are given power. Um, at the Maine Climate Council, for example, we're seeing representatives from fossil fuel um, from, from fossil fuel groups on, on the Climate Council and in its working groups. Um, we're seeing resistance from our government to uphold tribal sovereignty, resistance from our state to health healthcare access to all, um, and, and resistance to these calls of equity and justice and inclusion um, in, in all walks of our life. So I know that um, I have limited time to talk to you all tonight and really I could talk about climate justice for hours. So feel free to uh, reach out to me if you'd like to talk more about it. But I think with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Kelsey to introduce our next speaker um, and really grateful for you all for taking the time to listen to me. Oh, Kelsey, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I <laughs> well, haven't made that mistake yet. Uh, I am going to put everybody's full bios um, from our event website if you want to read more about what other people work on. Um, thank you so much, Anya, and thanks for all you do for the chapter and in all the other hats that you've worn as an activist. Um, that was a really exciting, broader kind of view of what's taking place across the state where actions are happening globally. Um, we're gonna 
invite a very interesting and specialist perception or perspective right now, um, thinking about how, um, you know, the economy economy or larger systems actually are part of this um, both structural racism, structural capitalism, and also um, just the ways that, you know, money and resources move through our community, which has direct impact on how we're going to make um, significant changes for climate change. So um, up next is Davis Taylor, Dr. Davis Taylor. He's a professor of economics and the Cody Van Heerden Chair of Economics and Quantitative Social Sciences at the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor. Um, he has served on the boards of National Resources Council of Maine, the Good Turn Food Cooperative in Rockland, and the Cooperative Development Institute, which is a really exciting organization um, that's near and dear to me about cooperative making, along with the policy committee of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. His research and community engagement focuses on cooperatives, cooperative economies, food systems, and ecological economies. Um, and so we're really excited to welcome him, and I'm going to get you so that you're pinned and you're ready to go. Welcome, Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, everybody hear me okay? Um, I jotted down a few notes to make sure I didn't uh, go over time and try to keep my thoughts clear here. So I'm going to do a, a little bit of reading and a little bit of ad hoc uh, commentary here. Um, so intersectionality uh, is an interesting uh, perspective. My understanding prior to the discussion tonight that it was mostly about social identity uh, and how that affects an, an, an individual. Um, or, so let me rephrase that, individual identity. Um, but I'm expanding the idea here to include uh, social position. And I hope that's okay that I, that I expanded the term in this regard. Um, even with a broader perspective, we can still think of individual identity in the context of, of race, ethnic identity, and class, and the intersectionality that, that produces within individuals in a larger context of people's social position within the economy. So I'm kind of expanding the idea a little bit, but hopefully it, it still makes sense, and I hope it's okay that I did this. Um, there is intersectionality all over the topics of the economy, uh, race, racism, and climate justice, okay? Um, it's economic activity, of course, that causes greenhouse gas emissions that are responsible for climate change. And while any expression of racism is, is repugnant, the economic dimension of racism is arguably the most costly, harmful, and in need of change. It's access to jobs, access to education, access to appropriate housing, access to healthcare. It's all about equal access, really, um, as both consumers and, and producers uh, where many Black, Indigenous, and people of color are denied. The key intersectionality in my mind is that economic inequality and discrimination around the world puts people of color at greater exposure to the negative risks and consequences of climate change. Okay, so I, I'm not really talking here about justice in the sense of the causes of climate change as, as much as I am the, the impacts. Okay. Globally, it's Bangladeshi farmers, it's Andean pastoralists, it's Tanzanian um, artisanal fishers. They're the ones who are really feeling the impacts of climate change now. In the United States and Canada, it's less about production and more about location. The rich live further up the hill, they have sturdier housing, they can move out of harm's way. The poor, who are disproportionately represented by BIPOC due to centuries of, of discrimination, have less capacity to migrate, um, less capacity to mitigate against climate change, and are less likely to receive assistance from government. I'm going to share um, a couple of just sort of general ideas here that I have been thinking about lately regarding these, is these issues. Um, what strikes and concerns me the most about the current historical moment is kind of the lack of recognition, the invisibility of economic difference that is making the context of the current impacts of, of, of climate change. Uh, um, that the way this difference is, is affecting people um, regarding climate change. We say that if we do something now, then climate change will be averted then, okay? Well, I haven't read the book, the perspective, this perspective seems to be captured in the title of Bill Gates' latest book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. If we just act now, there will be less problems then, okay? From a certain perspective, of course, this is true. Any action right now that, that combats climate change is good, um, presuming it's not preempting other more effective 
actions and the sooner the better. But to a significant extent, there really is no we and there really is no then, I think. Regarding the we, there are some people who are dying today of climate change, as, as Anya noted. And there are probably some people who are really never going to be touched. Unless the entire human species goes down the drain, some people are going to be able to buy their way out of this. Okay, We gives us a comfortable feeling that we're all, all in this together. And in some ways, that's true, of course. But in some ways, it's not. We cannot and should not erase the truth that people of color around the world are facing a much different reality regarding the impacts of climate change than are the affluent people of the world. Regarding the then, climate change is happening right now. It's impacting hundreds of millions of lives and probably killing tens of thousands of people every year. It's not then, it's now. Then gives us a comfortable feeling that we have yet to mess things up severely, that we can still escape. Erasing the reality that millions haven't escaped, won't escape, are not escaping. So, th so th this is a real tension, okay? I, of course, understand the activist message that we must do all that we can, that it's not too late in a certain sense, that uh, whatever avoidance of climate change we can do now will pay huge dividends later. And in that sense, it's a great economic return. But I also worry that this message disguises difference, different realities, differences that matter immensely. We somehow need to craft a message that communicates our togetherness along with terribly uneven impacts of climate change. Another big thought I have is there's, there's really two kinds of economics at work in the, um, that are necessary, I would say, to understanding the intersectionality of the economy, racism, and climate change. The first is the familiar kind of economics. It's the economics of production, distribution, consumption, it's supply and demand, prices, and most importantly, it's a distribution of income and income earning factors such as education. This sort of economics is, it is essential in understanding the situation we're facing. But I think there's a second kind of economics um, that is relatively new. It's a relatively new perspective on how economies function. And it's the economics of institutions. Institutions in this context are the formal and informal rules. And sorry, I'm going to get a little wonky here. Um, institutions are, are, are the formal and informal rules of an economy and the associated political system. What, what we now recognize is that these rules are incredibly important in determining economic outcomes. The formal rules are the laws, the courts, the property rights, the constitutions, the things that determine how things run. But informal rules are just as important the norms and expectations and understandings of how things get done, the, basically the culture. It's the informal institutions that are such a big part of racism, patriarchy, and other forms of oppression. And, and, and these are equally important to the formal institutions. It's the country's formal and informal institutions overall that determine its economic growth, its distribution of resources, and the role that justice plays in its economy. An understanding of the, and, the functioning of institutions is critical to understanding an economy, but what really matters in this context of race and climate change is institutional change. I believe that understanding institutional change will play a decisive role in the ways and degrees to which we, um, in which we tackle economic racism and, and climate change justice. Unfortunately, the news here isn't terribly good. Uh, the study of institutional change reveals that institutional change happens slowly and often haphazardly, particularly the informal institutions. In the United States, for example, we passed some great laws regarding civil rights and the environment in the 1960s and 1970s. These laws led to some great and significant changes, but clearly they didn't change everybody's minds. They didn't change their informal practices. They didn't change culture in a lot of places within the United States. Furthermore, Institutional change is dominated by elites and elites are very cautious about institutional change because clearly every win-win, um, even win-win changes are going to rock the boat, so to speak. Okay. Individual elites might get pushed out of the process of institutional change. Nowhere do you see this more clearly than in, than in our continued use of fossil fuels. There are so many win-win situations out there where we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, get better jobs, have economic growth, really transform our economy. And, and, and many of us are aware of this. 
but the, but the processes that these tails that these changes entail will lead to winners and losers. And even if we even if clearly the net gains are obvious, the elites in the fossil fuel industry and their allies in the political system are digging in their heels, regardless of how clearly the gains are to the planet, the human race, and even their own economies. There, there are analogous context to this, and the, uh, there are analogous situations to this in the context of racism and the institutions that perpetuate it. So I spent a lot of time thinking about institutions and um, it's, it's a very powerful perspective, I think. Lastly, um, something I've been thinking about lately uh, is the role of technological change in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our economy and around the world. Um, 20 odd years ago, when I first started studying ecological economics, I was pretty skeptical of what it is referred to as technological optimism. Okay, that's the basic idea that technology can essentially save us, that, that we can work around our environmental and perhaps even our social difficulties through improved technologies. Okay, the opposing perspective is technological pessimism. That argues that we can't rely on technology and that we should make deep cultural shifts in order to use fewer resources and do the proverbial saving of the planet. Like many social natural scientists at the time, I was very skeptical about relying on, on technology. And I furthermore believe that some cultural shifts would be a, a, a very good thing, would serve us very well. We should come to see that having more stuff for more people, for, for, most, for many people, doesn't lead to more happiness, I thought. And, and I still believe that. It doesn't lead to more happiness. It doesn't lead to better lives. And there's a whole interesting science out there on this that we would benefit from being less materialistic and that we would just be better off if we reduced our consumption rather than relying on technology to allow us to keep consuming while hopefully having less negative impacts on the planet. It was even easy in a sense to make the argument that a less materialistic attitude toward life would also lead to more social justice, even while recognizing that this was a very abstract relationship, we'd all sort of become Zen Buddhists and peace out. Um, I know this is a a huge cultural shift, um, a very big step, especially within the, the notion of institutional change that I discussed a moment ago, but I sure wasn't going to try to rely on technology. Um, today, I remain skeptical of technology in many dimensions. Technology is not going to restore the coral reefs. It's not going to bring back the rhinos. It certainly won't um, do things we should be, uh, pardon me, certainly, I certainly don't think we should be relying on geoengineering at this point. Um, but I look at the state of the world regarding global commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the degree to which those commitments are actually followed or achieved, and the roles that technologies of photovoltaics, wind, wind battery storage, and other technologies, the roles that those things are playing. And I'm beginning to rethink technology in general. I, I'm wondering if I was a bit too dismissive of it in the past. Um, it seems that we're just not terribly good at reducing our consumption. Um, through through simply cutting back as opposed to through technological change. So my, despite millennia of uh, spiritual practice and wisdom from various cultures around the world, despite all kinds of findings from contemporary scientists in the realms of psychology and sociology, we just seem unwilling to live our lives with less stuff. And I should say here, I'm speaking of those around the world who are living in relative material abundance, um, not those who are, who are at subsistence levels and, and suffering from material deprivation, although many of them, ironically, are leading very happy if materially shortened lives. Okay. Even my own little organization, College of the Atlantic, um, speaks very little about operating with less stuff, okay, about actually reducing our energy and material consumption. We just aren't willing to educate with less, okay? I, even though I think we could do um, a very good job, we could do just fine with this. If the greenest college in the world, uh, uh, the greenest college in the United States can't reduce consumption, it makes me very worried about the, um, the rest of the world in this regard. It seems we are throwing our hopes behind technology for better or for worse. It doesn't mean that people are bad or evil, you know, that we're just greedy people, um, although there's plenty of that out there. Um, there are explanations for our addiction to energy and our addiction to, to stuff. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the natural human desire for status and inclusion, although a lot of it also has to do with very successful marketing by large corporations. Okay. It just means that we probably shouldn't be hoping for the sorts of reductions we need in, in carbon and other resources via simply 
consuming less. It's going to be technology. Okay. And that's a little scary, but it seems to be the way things are going. Um, in my mind, technology provides the best news um, regarding climate change, which again, is also good news for communities of color around the world who are most affected by climate change. The plumbing price, the plummeting price of producing energy versus photovoltaics or wind um, is really heartening. Uh, the technology of energy storage is way ahead of where people thought it would be even just a couple of years ago. Economic growth and unfettered markets of the neoliberal utopia may be killing the planet, but the stampede to be the first to markets regarding electric cars, home energy storage, a, a newer, better, more, demogra more democratic grid. It's these places, uh, it seems to me, where we're seeing the most hope for, for actually addressing climate change. Um, this, of course, doesn't mean we should stop pressing for institutional change across all fronts. For example, we should continue to press for higher mileage requirements and the grandfathering of, or, and, and even the grandfathering of vehicles that run on fossil fuels. We should demand fewer emissions, better agriculture, better forestry, better care for our oceans, et cetera. And these will require legal restrictions, global negotiations, the sorts of things that the many great organizations like the Sierra Club are working on now. But as Amory Lovins used to say, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. And I would add to that, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we made stones illegal, okay? Markets that spur technological innovation and effective formal and informal institu institutional change supported by governments uh, creating the institutional framework to encourage them is really a, a great way, I think, to be able to, to get toward lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these markets and, the in, and institutional change and governance are not substitutes for each other. They are complements. We need them both. I know that putting, um, this is getting towards the end of my comments here, um, putting a price on carbon is controversial um, in environmental and social justice circles. I checked out the um, Sierra Club National my page and found that there's some support for it there, but I know that people have lots of different minds regarding this. Um, I have some understanding of why, but I think an effective price on carbon um, globally applied would, would really fix a lot of things relatively quickly. Okay, achieving this would be extremely hard. The forces of institutional inertia are just as strong in this realm as, as in others in, in, the, in the ways that I described earlier. The possibilities of corporate malfeasance are high. And while we probably don't have the time here right now to go into the gory details of carbon pricing, I think the rewards of a price on carbon would be dramatic. Um, lastly, even with, success, with successful technology, we haven't avoided climate change. And as Anya pointed out, things will probably get worse before they get better in terms of the actual temperature increases, along with severity of storms, droughts, things like that. This means that regardless of how successful our technologies might be, we need to address the historical inequities that make climate change mitigation a very unevil, uneven playing field for black, indigenous, and people of color in the United States and around the world. I'll be happy to Thank expand you. on these comments or talk more about later. Sorry, We're going to have a chance to answer questions with the whole panel at the end. Uh, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, a really exciting and dynamic track through um, so many different complicated systems. And I really appreciate your eloquence, Davis, with them, leading us through all of them. So last but not least, um, we are welcoming to the virtual Zoom room, uh, Josh Wood, who is a now 16 year old racial and climate justice organizer based in Sanford, Maine. At Maine Strikes, he's the co-organizing director. He served as the youngest communications director in Maine's Black Lives Matter movement after the death of so many black people as we continued to look at this week, uh, including children across America during a global pandemic. Um, by he started a petition to remove school resource officers in his hometown um, and his awareness of racial justice issues has grown increasingly local to his area. Um, in August 2020, he helped create initiatives in Black Lives Matter Maine that have since seen the demilitarization of police departments in small towns, equitable changes to schooling and more. Um, he now continues to work with Maine Climate Strikes to pass countrywide climate emergencies and manage statewide action teams. 
Um, Josh is going to join us to talk about um, how we can make big uh, ch change on big levels in smaller places. Um, let me unpin myself. Where is Josh? So you can pin him. There we go. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, of course. Hey, everyone. My name is Josh okay. Wood, and I use he, him pronouns. I was the director of communications for Black Lives Matter Maine, uh, now known as Project Relief. Project Relief is an organization that does mutual aid projects across the state, providing basic necessities to families like food, clothing, money, and more. Um, at Black Lives Matter Maine, the organization was able to expand into geographically marginalized communities. Um, so we were able to protest across Maine. Um, I was also the co-organizing director for Maine Strikes, a youth-led organization responsible for climate strikes across our state in support of climate justice. Um, and today I want to talk to you about how race and climate are inextricably intertwined or intersectional to each other. Uh, racial justice is climate justice as much as it is environmental justice. Here's why. Green Action says a world that encompasses environmental justice is a world where people live at their highest potential without interruption by inequity. In a country which was only created to serve white people and frankly white people's interests, this is not possible. Our neighborhoods as black people have more police and less trees. And as a result of that backward investment, our communities are brutalized beyond belief. Take what you see in the news as an example. By defunding and reinvesting money into our communities, we will finally see those trees instead of our bodies on TV. Uh, we're not there though yet. And celebrating things like Derek Chauvin's conviction is just simply not enough. And we can't expect police convictions to save anyone's life because they didn't save George Floyd's. Real justice would be George Floyd coming home to his family, but it never works that way for victims of police brutality, nor does it work for the countless people of color who die at the hands of corporations uh, that pollute our air. In most states, police don't even enforce environmental regulations. They're too focused on shooting us. So it's time to start policing the police because killing us is not their job. Maybe if they were focused on planting trees, the world would be a better place but instead they're making money off of our neighborhoods and livelihoods. Clearly a system like that doesn't work and it's not enough. I wanna share with you a presentation. Share screen, all right, share. Awesome. So if you see this big saying right there, it says racial justice is climate justice. And I find that to be true, especially in my smaller circles that I talk to about this issue. Racial justice is climate justice is a saying that is not as old as time, but definitely important. Celebrating Earth Day without acknowledging the deaths of Dante Wright and Micaiah Bryant is not enough either. If the government put its money where its mouth is, maybe Dante and Micaiah would still be alive today. Unfortunately, because of their death, we have people's attention that Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter means a lot of things. Black Lives Matter is as much of an environmental movement as it is a movement to decry police brutality. It's a movement of love for our people and our planet. Eric Garner died because he couldn't breathe after being put in a chokehold by the police. There are also inner city kids who are dying because they can't breathe from pollution. So here's what we're doing. Ooh, we can't see your presentation. Hold on, <laughs> stop share. Josh, if you'd like me to help you too, you can share with me and I could share. Yeah, for sure. That would be much better. All right, I had just shared it with you. So to continue, Black Lives Matter means a lot of things, uh, but it's more to decry police brutality. Um, and here's what we're doing about that. Outside of Maine and bigger, bigger inner cities, BIPOC communities see the impact of environmental inequity and racism. Take Cooperation Jackson, for an example, an organization based in Mississippi. 
uh, they point out the adverse effects of climate change uh, by providing housing cooperatives uh, for black folks in the city. Um, it's an initiative being tried and failed in cities and states everywhere. Clearly we have work to do in Maine. African Americans are taking action where the government can't, especially youth. And I wanna tell you about some. Last summer, I led an effort to demilitarize my police, my small town's police department. Uh, this was the first time I'd been to my city hall. Like Kasia Burks, I thought the space provided by city hall would make some really good low cost apartments. I could easily envision our unhoused population living in there. But that's not what we were there to do. We were there to ask our town to take a leap of faith, investing money from the police into environmental initiatives. Now, instead of hearing us out, Sanford had representatives at our protest with guns, brandishing guns in our faces because they didn't believe the message that Black Lives Mattered. When we protested, people came out and brandished weapons at us. Like Anya said, these institutions couldn't care less. This is where environmental racism truly manifests itself. But we have to be careful because police brutality is not the only way racism manifests itself. Racism is also not being able to go on hikes because you fear someone will brutalize you in the woods. It's the microaggressions we hear in the workplace. It's the racial profiling we are subject to by police. It's the socioeconomic injustice and disadvantage we're subject to in every facet of our lives. It's the racist stereotypes that society, media, and government continue to peddle. It's undoing the enduring legacy of slavery that continues to scar the black diaspora in our communities. So white people, I hope what I've said makes you uncomfortable enough to act. Simply celebrating a conviction like Jarek Chauvin's is complacency. Dismantling oppressive systems requires you to have hard conversations, organize and act, planting the seeds to uproot the same systems destroying our planet. Thank you. I've also left some links at the end of my presentation and I will drop them in the chat. Thank you so much, Josh, for um, all of your work and on top of that, taking time today to share it with us. Um, those photographs are really powerful and uh, we look forward to, I'll enjoy taking a look at the resources that you shared too um, in, the, in the links. Um, so I wanna welcome all of our um, speakers to, I'm gonna put us back. If you are um, watching, you might look at gallery view. Um, if you'd like to turn on your chat, we're going to be in the Q&A portion of this um, if folks are interested in participating via video with your own questions. Um, you're welcome to put them into the chat too, and um, I can um, also amplify some people's if they want me to read their question out loud to the three that we've um, assembled here today. Um, one of the biggest things that Anya had mentioned um, who in invited the panelists here today to talk with us is just about um, the nature that, you know, we are really at, a, again, a moment. There's, there's this legacy of the environmental intergenerational movement about what's the next youth frontier and how does that reconcile itself into the movement. We are again in that you know, in that forefront where we have so many more youth activists, both on the climate justice front, as well as the racial justice and social justice fronts. Um, so would the three of you maybe comment about what you see as a future for an intergenerational coalition? Um, how can we build that more in Maine? Who do we need to be listening to? Um, and how do we make more space for young people in our movements, um, either from a teacher or from a youth activist perspective? Josh, Gosh, I'd, I'd love for you to go first as the youngest person in the room if you're open to it. Yeah, um, so for intergenerational alliances, there's a lot we can do. Um, we need to be more empathetic to each other, I think, is the first step, um, especially in defining generational gaps. So we understand that our generation grew up with technology, older generations did not. Um, it's 
really an easy thing to learn. This is not a dig at older folks, but um, we definitely do need to be more empathetic. Older folks do need to be more empathetic. Younger folks need to be more empathetic, um, especially about racial and socioeconomic gaps. I feel like there's a huge gap there. Um, I've seen it in organizing spaces where folks talk over each other. Um, and yeah, I feel like we all can do more. Thanks so much. Do Anya or Davis want to chime in? Anya, this means you're next for going. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I I think, um, you know, so uh, another hat that I wear is I'm the youth representative on the Maine Climate Council. So um, have really seen some of these dynamics of like adults versus youth uh, play out. And I think um, something that, um, that I think I talk a lot about, ab that I talk about a lot as a, a youth activist is that, um, you know, I, in my generation, um, and, you know, folks in this room as well, but, you know, my, I, I will be experiencing climate change in a way that's different than um, some of the older generations that, that are currently on earth. Um, I think climate change has been a part of my life since I was a child and continues to be. It's shaped my decisions as I become an adult. It's shaped where I wanted to go to school. It's shaped um, where I want to live. It's sh shaping what I want to do for my career. It's shaping, you know, my future decisions of deciding whether or not I want to have children. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an undeniable part of my life in a way that I think is not true for all generations that are currently on this earth. Um, and so I think we really need to be listening to our younger generations, but also thinking, you know, generations ahead. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know, that's a whole nother rabbit hole I could do, go down. But, um, but basically I think, and then I, I also really agree with Josh, I think especially in the environmental movement, there is a lot of institutional knowledge and a lot of really amazing, um, you know, grassroots work that has been happening in the state of Maine for many years, for, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, longer than that. There's a lot of, a lot of history in this state that needs to be taught and learned from. And I think um, definitely what Josh was saying about empathy and having more conversations is I think really uh, an important piece. Um, but as a young person who's been told to my face that maybe my ideas aren't important, maybe they're just bad. Um, I had an adult tell me that once <laughs> related to the climate council. Um, I think we need to do a better job at listening to our future generations and listening to the young folks and what they are screaming and striking from school about um, because they're the ones that are going to be, you know, experiencing this in such a real way. So, yeah. I would totally echo uh, what's being said, particularly uh, the ideas about listening and I'll take the opportunity to apologize for going a little bit over my allotted time. I was that speaker, sorry. So I should- I think I, I went over too, Davis. It's no, no well, worries. Well, I'll spend more time <laughs> listening. Um, listening is, is, of course, always a great idea. And it's something we can sort of say, oh, of course we're gonna listen and we should listen to young people. But I feel that the way people of my generation need to listen should change. Uh, it is not just sort of like, oh, let's listen to the youth and hear their ideas and stuff like that. I feel a palpable shift in the energy and the capacity of the young people I work with these days. And they are not just um, angry, upset, but they're also very well educated in, on, on the issues. And um, it's I, I just learn a lot. I learn a lot more than I used to. So I think a kind of listening that really opens our minds to the possibility that some ideas that just seem implausible or too radical 
we we need to be able to take those in. And I suspect the people in this uh, gathering are very progressive and open-minded people. But nevertheless, I think there, there's more space for that. Um, it's just so exciting to hear what's happening. And I think climate justice issues got the ball rolling over the past four or five years. Young people just were too angry, saw too many stupid things going on. And then the events of, of the past year regarding social justice and diversity, equity, inclusion issues and, and, and police violence and so on and so forth. And building up before that in, in previous events over the past four or five years, just really brought out an, an energy and intensity and a focus that people of my generation can really benefit from. Um, it's just really astounding and I'm so really thrilled to be a part of it. My next question is also about kind of broadening the coalition and I think each, uh, the, each of you has a really interesting perspective on um, whether it's interdisciplinary between urban, rural, um, this idea of just like starting initiatives that bring it, are making a bigger tent for a lot of people or finding strategic partnerships with the environmental movement and organizations that specialize in something else. Um, I see that Davis with you, with kind of economic structures, teaching as a kind of radicalizing practice, uh, as well as collaborative collectives, Josh with like clear crossover between both being an activist that sits in one racial justice movement and as well as the environmental movement. Um, I noticed that you were like teaching, doing a teach-in with the Audubon Society back in February. Um, so like showing up in all these different communities and making this crossover dialogue and kind of syncing those movements or Anya, you know, the Climate Coalition or this other kind of coalition building stuff that can include everybody from small businesses, like a solar business to, and you know, professional activists to lobbyists. Um, so what, what do you think is the most important thing we need right now in, in making connections to make a stronger network across our state? Or is there something you've seen in the past couple of years that really excited you about how people worked together to get either legislation or something in private development closed or changed? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the baton first here. Um, as I uh, was mentioned in, in my in my introduction, um, I work with cooperatives and the way people are thinking about cooperatives is, is extremely exciting these days. And it's an extremely broad perspective. It's, it's not just about trying to uh, provide economic, uh, well, jobs or, or products or so on for people. It's not really just about economic democracy. It's about voice. Um, I was at a conference a number of years ago on cooperatives. It was, it was in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, which is a, a, a very sort of challenged place economically, extremely diverse, plenty of, of poverty. And I was just amazed that the conference was dominated by people in their 20s. And they were interested in cooperatives because they saw that saw it as a social justice issue. And um, they wanted to, to form worker-owned businesses and housing co-ops and so on and so forth because they saw it as a way to bring power. They said that there, there is no justice without control and there's no control without ownership. And that has just struck me ever since. So I see, from my angle, I, I think there's way more than just cooperatives out there, but cooperatives are this really amazing way in which you can bring in a lot of things. And we're working with, with MOFCA right now to expand uh, farmer cooperatives and work on farms and things like that. So there's all kinds of exciting things going on there. Kelsey, could you repeat the question? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Just thinking about what are either some tools or things that you've been learning about making wider coalitions um, in your personal practice or examples where you feel like recent changes or trends are um, making that kind of cross-pollinization possible. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I, th I think um, something that I've been thinking about a lot recently, especially coming to work with Sierra Club is that, you know, one organization and one person can't do everything. And I think we're starting to realize that more and more, but there's still this like dream and want to be like the end all be all like climate justice group or climate justice organization. And like, I'm guilty of that as well. Like I want to be able to like be doing the most good, but I think, you know, we do the most good when we um are playing to our strengths and when we are 
um, figuring out what we, you know, as an individual or as a community or as a coalition can do the most good, um, you know, given our resources and background. And I think something that I've been seeing a lot more of recently is like folks really putting in the work to um, understand, you know, their own personal lives and histories. And I think, you know, we saw that a lot this summer with, especially with the movement for Black Lives, saw a lot of like white people finally realizing that they're, you know, racist and like steeped in racist institutions and like really starting to think about that. Um, and I think, you know, like, like Josh was alluding to in his talk, that's a step in the right direction, but, you know, not, not enough. But, um, but I think it's, even since, you know, I started working in the climate justice space just a few years ago, um, it's encouraging to like see that shift of people really going from that like urgent, we need to act now um, and just do something to like, all right, let's like take a step back and really like evaluate why we are in this place and why we are acting the way that we, we are. And like, that's the way that we're going to be able to move forward and like actually solve this is if we like actually understand where we are. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that really answered the question. Um, <laughs> but no, that's it's what a, it's a really helpful reflection. And um, Josh, I want to turn it last to you. And I don't know whether or not you want to answer this from a like you've existed in different coalitions or spaces or also just talking about size of community and like what you need to get stuff done um, in smaller communities and what you've learned about that. Yeah, well, first, as a Black dude and the only person of color on this panel, I think we all got to be a bit more intersectional when we make connections, especially when we consider like Black trans people and Indigenous trans folks, um, as well as like super marginalized populations in Maine. Um, in order to be intersectional, I think we have to be accommodating to folks and really meet people where they are. So meeting people where they are means providing stipends for work that youth are doing or providing stipends for work that marginalized folks are doing. Instead of just going out into the streets and saying, I protested or I supported Black Lives Matter, so that makes me an anti-racist, um, you really have to do the work and dig deeper in. And the same goes for the climate justice realm. Um, if you go into the street and say, I protested for climate justice, but then throw money at a corporation uh, like Walmart or Amazon or Exxon, rather than like an indigenous owned bookstore or a black owned bookstore or a bookstore owned by even your own neighbor, um, then you're not really doing the work. And I think people need to realize that more and have a better awakening of how these issues really are intersectional to each other. Maybe pick up a book. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I was looking for the link to put in the chat, but um, there was some exciting philanthropy news here in Maine where Maine Initiative has just made $100,000 in grants towards mutual aid organizations, um, mostly BIPOC, that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, for those of you that have not heard that acronym before, um, organizations, um, which is a really exciting, just like frontier of seeing that that redistribution of funds to the people doing the work in their community. It, you know, we should just trust the leaders that know how to distribute those funds and who needs the support. Um, so I, yes, thank you so much, Josh, for bringing that up. Um, in the chat, I also put a little bit of information about the Sierra Club and kind of the big shift towards this as far as where we are with base building and coalition building um, for a green future. And so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and Sierra Club is really open to feedback. And so um, if any of you have questions, I want to open the floor to the attendees here. Um, feel free to raise your hand or if you want to put it in the chat um, and then we can answer that to all of um, or put that to our group that we've assembled here today. Um, or Sierra Club staff. And um, yeah, I don't see, and maybe the other hosts can help me see if there, anybody raises their hand. Um, or otherwise I have a couple more questions I can ask. I'll put one more prompt. Would any of our panelists like to ask questions of each other <laughs> and, what, and what you heard today? <laughs> I 
well, I'm going to jump into my next question, but please, um, if folks have any, um, we, we still do have everybody for a few more minutes. Um, just thinking about futurisms, which I think is like really, you know, we are on Earth Day. It's meant to be this celebratory kind of both day of action, day of community caretaking, day of protest. Um, it's both of resistance and joy. Um, and thinking about those two principles together as we head into the future, um, what are each of you working on that you're most excited about? Or what is something that's happening in the state that you want to, that you're going to be fighting to see happen um, in the next legislative session or in your local community? And yeah, what's, what, what's next for each of you? I'm gonna call on Anya because you have not gone first yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what's next for me? Um, I'm continuing to, to work with the chapter. Um, I, um, I'm, I think something that I'm really excited about that's really focused around climate justice is working with um, the Coalition Main Climate Action Now on creating a climate justice crash course that we're, we're um, trying to create by the end of the year for activists and folks in the state of Maine to learn more about climate justice, um, both at the international level, like I was talking about um, during my talk, but also very much at the state level, um, including more stories like, um, like that Josh shared um, of, of things that are happening within the state of Maine. Um, so that's a project that I'm really excited to work on. I think um, climate justice is something that's like extremely hard to, uh, you know, put into just a few sentences or like even an hour and a half conversation. It's many, many conversations. It took me like a whole college degree to start to figure out. Um, so, um, yeah, excited to work on projects to make climate justice more accessible to folks um, and to, yeah, continue working with the chapter to, um, you know, make climate justice a reality in, in the state of Maine. That's great. Uh, Davis or Josh, either of you want to hop in with something that's exciting on your horizon? Yeah, I'll go. Um, so I want to focus on promoting youth leadership in my own community and because there are a lot of young blooming leaders here that do not have the resources to speak up or get into activism. So I've been helping folks out, lending them platforms, um, and working behind the scenes really to promote voices that have been shut out. Um, because I know what it feels like to have been shut out and being platformed and sharing my story has been honestly really cool. Um, and I want others to have that chance too. Um, also, I want to go into mental health advocacy, um, advocating for mental health and capacity and activism spaces and youth spaces. Um, and you will also see me doing communications and press for a release calling out fossil fuel companies pretty soon. Fabulous. I don't know if you sleep, but uh, thank you for continuing to wow, Josh. <laughs> to your accomplishments for 16 are uh, truly intimidating. Uh, Davis, you want to give us the final words? And if nobody puts a question in the chat, we'll all wave goodbye and happy Earth Day to one another. No pressure. <laughs> um, I continue to uh... My, my, my research and scholarship is focusing on the role of elites within our economy. Uh, and um, I'm also doing some work with the Cooperative Development Institute and MOFCA, as I noted. But what really has me excited is this very small project I'm working on. I'm, I'm preparing to co-host a talk at College of Atlantic over the summer with Roger Milliken. So you, some of you might remember Roger Milliken. He's a former CEO of the Baskahegan Company. They have about 100, 120,000 acres of land up in Washington County. That's uh, some of the you know, best managed forests in the state in terms of sustainability and, 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 and production. He's former uh, chair of, of the Nature Conservancy, not, yeah, chair of the board of the Nature Conservancy at the national level. Uh, he was involved with the Nature Conservancy getting a large tract of land on the, on the St. John River. 
And what's really amazing in talking with him is that he's um, a big advocate and a close friend of Robin Wall Kimmer, who's is the author of, of Braiding Sweetgrass. And um, many of you have probably read that book. If you haven't, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer is just an astoundingly good book. There, it's in, in a genre of, of Native American writers writing about environmental issues, but it is off the charts in, in its wisdom and its approaches. Um, and, and braiding means all kinds of different things in the context of the title. Um, so it's, it was really amazing. The former CEO of, of, a, of a timber company is, is looking at the world in that way. And I find that extremely heartening. And he's also questioning the role of elites within the leadership of things like climate change. Um, he thinks, you know, on the one hand, having Bill Gates interested in social justice issues and, and, and climate and so on and so forth is great, but he really questions it too. I, um, and it sees it as a way of just continuing elite dominance instead of really addressing things at a more fundamental um, systemic level. So that's a project that has me really excited. There's, there's lots of cool ideas going around there and it gives me some confidence that, that a person, he's, he's 10 years older than me, he's sort of a, a stalwart of, of the business community, but he is really seeing that we need to change some things. So I'm excited about that. Thank you so much. And that's a really great um, piece of critique to be thinking about in the years ahead, as we've also this year, we've seen mega donations from Jeff Bezos and Mackenzie Scott, which are clearly um, exciting towards climate change features with big funding for research and possibly, you know, as you said, questions about big tech and whether or not we should be te tech optimistic or pessimistic. Um, Heidi, I want to uh, have a nice comment in the chat and also I see you've raised your hand. So we'll give you the final question. And Davis, if you have the link to that event, if it's online or the date, please put it in the chat for us. Um, Heidi, I'm gonna unmute you. Thank you. I am a proud uh, former resident of the Down East Maine area. I, uh, grad I started at George Stevens Academy in my sophomore year of high school, was part of the outing club there, and also graduated from Deer Isle Stonington High School in the class of 1984 and also attended College of the Atlantic. So, and I'm glad to have met David, uh, 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 Dave, <laughs> uh, I'm getting everybody's name, uh, Davis Taylor <laughs> at Common Ground Fair a couple of years ago, or almost a decade ago, but I think we've run into each other since then. <laughs> um, so my questions have to do is with the concern about what's happening while I have a larger concern about the, the, the law of respecting the laws of nature. And I do really con am concerned about the, or care about the, the indigenous rights, um, uh, EJ communities and things that are happening. But my concern is, is anybody, I've heard somewhere along the line that there's a big, like my, they're, they're, the, the Kerr-McGee mine, it may have been renamed since I was there in Blue Hill, Maine, needs a little bit of attention. And I also was wondering what your chapter was doing about the, um, about the pine tree amendment. And also in terms of one of my major issues had since 1991, and meeting cut some of the Cree spokespeople is the, the genocide and ecological ethnic cleansing of our Cree and, in, and in, Inuit neighbors and other indigenous relatives up in the James Bay and other areas in the, the, the wake of the Hydro-Quebec mega dams disaster. And not to mention our pristine main, main wilderness, which is a huge, carbon sequestering resource that's left on our planet that we need to ensure stays put and doesn't get bulldozed. And also with the windmills that are coming through from the Western, Maine, Western Mountains and Rivers Corporation that is trying to sort of make inroads in that. So I'd like to know, 
like to know what you guys are doing and not just as a chapter, but with also with the, with the folks at uh, College of the Atlantic and anybody else in the chapter that would like to talk about what's being done in their own communities. I would love to hear from you about this. Yeah, this is a really exciting, um, great question, Heidi, for like an ending question about just like some specific really big issue topics. There was a bunch of questions in there. So I'm going to try to answer a couple of them, point to also a structural question about our chapter, and then I'll open it up to everybody else. Um, I'm going to stick in the chat our um, press releases and um, testimony that the chapter gave towards um, when there was conversation about the CMP transmission line. Um, so that would, um, and you know, there was some great resources, both from our climate change conference in 2019, as well as various community conversations that we've had um, that have featured both our um, some indigenous First Nations Canadian neighbors um, talking, you know, giving testimony and talking about the research in their communities that this is causing to native um, fishing rights, as well as other things. Um, the executive committee has been extremely involved in giving testimony and trying to give um, testimony to that. I would highly recommend if those of you on this call, if this just struck your fancy and you're not reading our e-news to take a look at um, what's taking place in the chapter. And maybe I'm going to just quickly um, pass the mic to Anya just to quickly, maybe you can point people to the teams that work on this and maybe just introduce the team structure as our staff person. Um, each, you know, different areas of environmental activism within the chapter have different teams and those teams are coalition and volunteer led. So if, especially if you're interested in one of these topics to find out you know, the Sierra Club team that would be either the appropriate one that's already doing action or to bring that up um, at those teams. Oh, thank you, Marina. That's great. Uh, the team opportunities are um, in the chat, but if one of you want to talk in, uh, about that, and then I'm just going to open the floor if anybody wants to comment about um, those various issues that uh, Heidi brought before we sign off the chat. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Um, and thanks to Marina for sharing that in the chat. Um, I know we also have a volunteer uh, orientation coming up next Wednesday and would uh, encourage folks to sign up for that if they're interested in joining um, the chapter on a volunteer basis. Um, but yeah, um, I guess, um, how do I put this briefly? Um, <laughs> I, I guess, it, you know, in terms of the Pine Tree Amendment, that's something that the chapter is definitely focused on. Um, Definitely uh, the um, fight for tribal sovereignty is something that is a um, chapter priority as well as the CMP transmission line. And um, Sarah or Marina, the other staff folks on the line, feel free to hop off mute if you wanna talk more about that. But um, yeah, um, yeah, I would, I would just encourage folks to come to the volunteer orientation if you wanna learn more about our teams and kind of the more individual projects that we're working on. Um, we do have local climate action teams across the state doing local climate uh, action work in folks, um, you know, immediate communities. Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, Josh, I wanna invite you to talk to if you want to talk about any ways that folks can get involved either with uh, project relief or main strikes um, moving forward or Davis if you have any um, you know thoughts about action action steps that folks can take moving forward. I didn't think this one. Um, so following Project Relief on Instagram is the best way to get involved, especially because we always need money. So money is the number one thing that we need um, because we're trying to feed folks, we're trying to put clothes on folks, we're trying to meet people where they are, like I said. Um, although I am not really involved anymore, I know that we are doing some great work also, another mutual aid project that you could donate to if you can't get out on the streets, you can't support people in town halls, city halls, whatever, is Main Needs. Main Needs does a lot of great, excellent work supporting folks, putting clothes on people, um, toys for kids, boots, mittens, hats, shirts, socks, name it. Um, Main Strikes right now is working on Earth Day initiatives. Um, 
we are submitting written testimony in support of some bills that are being passed in the state legislature. You can see it on Climate Strike Maine's Instagram. Um, Maine Youth for Climate Justice and MCAN, which is a part of the coalition that we're in, is doing a lot of great work surrounding bills as well, legislative priorities. So if you want to get involved in any of that, uh, just hit us up on Instagram. Um, and if you don't do Instagram, then there are always websites and emails that you can use. And I've dropped all of those links in the chat. Thanks so much, Josh. Davis, do you have some uh, resources from up in your neck of the woods? I don't have anything to match, anything close to, to, to what's just been articulated. That Those steps are very uh, impressive. But I would just say in general, um, kind of tying back to some of the things I said, uh, I said that institutional, institutional change is hard to make happen, but it, it does happen. It happens through continued pressure. And Heidi, the, the breadth of your of your questions just speaks to sort of intersectionality, if, if you will, if I could take a little liberty there, um, just how there's all these different things going on. And we just have to keep pressing, just have to keep pressing and pressing and pressing. Um, some of you know, a couple months ago, General Motors announced that they're going to, they say, they're going to stop making fossil fuel powered cars by 2035. Um, that's astounding. Some people are suspicious of it, but it didn't happen because they all of a sudden decided to, to, to worry about climate change and be nice. It happened because people were pushing, pushing, pushing. And so all these action steps that Anya and Josh suggested are, are really powerful ways. And we, and we just have to, um, ways of making change and we just have to keep pushing. Great. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for celebrating Earth Day with us. I wish you all a happy Earth Day. I hope you've walked away with either some things to read about, some ideas about who you want to invite to your uh, local climate coalition um, or how you can participate in Sierra Club with our work. Um, and uh, if anybody has any last links, please stick them in the chat and um, we hope you'll just stay tuned to the e-news and to all the great organizations that are represented through this incredible <laughs> group of three speakers that are active on different fronts that um, all really add to a, a broader, more equitable um, environmental coalition as we move into the future. So thank you all for your time and um, this has been really, really wonderful. Thank you everyone. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thank you.